Here's someone with his finger on the pulse of AI, giving a unique level of insight. I think we're living through two big global changes. One is geopolitical and the other is technology. The interesting thing is they're happening at once. So you've got the world moving to uh, a much more, uh, well, let's call it the moment of American unipolarity is over. There are now adversaries, uh, particularly China, that are near peer or even potentially uh, stronger than the US in certain ways. So that's a fundamental geopolitical shift. But at the same time, you're seeing a revolution in artificial intelligence, technology which will change every aspect of our lives, not least defense and military. And I think that will play out over a very short period of time. This could happen in five to 10 years. And it's of the scale of the Industrial Revolution, but will play out over a much shorter period of time. How does the AI component play into Palantir? It's central, clearly, to what you do. How, how does generative AI and large language models, how are you building them into your products, particularly when it comes to automated defense software and solutions? So we, we provide the software layer in which you deploy the models. So the LLMs are held, if you like, in harnesses by our software so that they can be used in secure, auditable, and transparent ways. And that means you can get the maximum value from them. The best way of thinking about an LLM is like a unit of cognition. So all of the workflows, all of the daily tasks that involve some element of human cognition, those are what you might be able to replace over time with LLMs. Now, of course, you need to do that in a way that's very secure, that's very transparent, that's very auditable. But that's what what we're embarking upon now. So our software is being deployed by a number of uh, allies in the West broadly defined to do precisely this. And what you're seeing is an exponential improvement in their productivity and in the efficiency of what they've traditionally done. So that's here and now. What does that look like then in five years time, given how rapidly AI is innovating? And if scaling continues as we expect, what does defense software look like in five years? How agentic will it be? And how do you keep human in the loop? So I think the, the question of how you keep humans in the loop is going to be a policy question. Uh, technologically, unfortunately, I think we're moving in a direction where much of the process can be automated. So lots of this could be done by agents. And so the big question that we're all going to have to confront is where do you insist on having a human in the loop? And I think in the West, we're very clear about the importance of maintaining that. My concern is that adversaries may not be. What specifically does Palantir put in place to ensure that there aren't disastrous errors in the deployment of this software? What mitigating factors are built in? Well, you could think of our software as the mitigating factor. So we are the harness in which you run the model so that you can do that transparent, these securely and auditably. And the audit is the key thing. It means you can know and you can go back in time to check when a decision was taken, what did the decision maker know at that moment in time? What was the context in which they made the decision and so forth? And in the end, that's the safeguard. There's a human in the loop taking the decision, but the software captures everything that the human knew at the time. And so, for example, if it's a, a question of collateral damage, was that something that was available as information to the decision maker at the moment when they took that step? You've worked very closely, of course, Palantir, in, in Ukraine for a number of years since that conflict. What has Palantir learned? What has your team learned by operating, working with the Ukrainians, particularly when it comes to the pace of digital transformation on the battlefield? Ukraine has been the R&D lab for AI in a military context for the last three years. It is the absolute bleeding edge of military technology. There is no substitute for a real battlefield. You can build things in the laboratory, you can test them, but you don't know whether they really work until you've seen it on the battlefield. And Ukraine, sadly, is where that is currently happening. The, I would pay enormous credit to the Ukrainians here. They have been uh, phenomenally innovative. Uh, they're ingenious in many ways. Part of that is, is circumstance that they uh, have not had all of the equipment and resources that they would have liked, and so they've been forced to innovate. But that has led to an extraordinary acceleration in, in military technology, where you're seeing major leaps every six to eight weeks, where tactics and procedures have to change because of some fundamental technological discovery or progress. And it, I think the, the only historic analogy that I'm, I'm aware of is 
the, the development of radar during the Second World War, where every bombing raid back and forth across the channel led to some fundamental discovery in radar. You're seeing something similar occur today in artificial intelligence in Ukraine. You've signed pretty significant contracts with the MOD here in the UK. You're investing here in the UK. How does that position Palantir to grow and lock in future contracts of that size and scale, not just in the UK, but on the continent? The UK is, we believe, the country outside of the US and China that has the, 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 the best quality and quantity of the kind of engineering talent that you need to build software like ours. So the UK can be uh, an epicenter of defense military technology development. It has all of, the, all of those ingredients. So that's why we're very keen to make a significant investment here. We want to tap that talent in effect. We already have a thousand people in London, but, and that is our second largest office globally, but we want to grow that significantly over the next five years. And the UK is the, you know, the premier military power in Europe. Uh, it's a key pillar of NATO. Uh, it, I think it, it has the potential to be a key bridge uh, into the rest of the continent, but also act as that security guarantor for many other countries. Ukraine has become the world's live testing ground for AI warfare, and Palantir has embedded itself deeper into a foreign military than any tech company has in history. Palantir's software, which uses AI to analyze satellite imagery, open source data, drone footage, and reports from the ground, presents commanders with military options and is responsible for a lot of the targeting we're seeing currently in the Ukraine. In September 2025, the UK signed a billion dollar five-year defense deal with Palantir to deploy the most advanced AI-enabled defense technology honed on the battlefield in Ukraine and used extensively by the US and NATO. Palantir's UK head, Lewis Mosley, has said a lot of research and development has been done in Ukraine, and the battlefield itself has showed how much AI has transformed modern warfare. NATO purchased Palantir's AI system in just six months, one of their fastest purchases in history, and the system allows 20 to 50 soldiers to analyze data from a battlefield instead of requiring hundreds or even thousands of analysts. Think about what this means operationally. Palantir's Gotham platform ingests drone footage, satellite imagery, intercepts communications, even tips from civilians, and fuses them into a coherent operational picture with targeting cycles measured in minutes instead of traditionally days. Every delay you remove from the decision cycle gives you an advantage. When your opponent needs hours to plan a strike and you need minutes, you can respond to battlefield changes that they haven't even processed yet. The UK deal shows how valuable this battlefield testing has become. Palantir will invest up to £1.5 billion to help make the UK a defence innovation leader and establish London as the base for Palantir's European defence business. The billion dollar deal with the UK is Palantir's first 10 figure contract outside of the US. More than half a dozen Ukrainian agencies, including Ministry of Defense, Economy and Education, are using Palantir's product and Palantir provided them to Ukraine free of charge. This is the business model no one talks about. Give away your platform in the world's most watched conflict, prove it works better than anything else available, then watch NATO members line up to buy it. Allied command operations began using Palantir's Maven system within 30 days of finalizing the acquisition in March 2025. The scale of what Palantir built in Ukraine becomes clearer when you see the Pentagon's response. In 2025, Palantir secured a $100 million contract to expand its AI targeting tools, granting all five branches of the US military expanded access to the Maven smart system, reaching tens of thousands of additional service members. The military doesn't hand out contracts like that unless the technology has been proven under fire. What makes this particularly valuable as an R&D lab is the feedback loop. Palantir's software processes raw intelligence from sources, including drones, satellites, Ukrainians on the ground, and radar that can see through cloud and thermal images, and AI-enabled models learn and improve with each strike. Palantir has a team of engineers in Ukraine that is constantly experimenting with new tools. Every Ukrainian attack becomes training data, every Russia countermeasure forces an adaption in real time. But this technological sprint forward is creating an ethical gap that nobody's ready to address. The real danger lies not in whether AI can automate warfare, but in the risk that adversaries will deploy it first while Western democracies remain locked in ethical debates. Current US policy states that the US will maintain a human in all actions critical to nuclear weapon decisions. Lewis raises what might be the most important question of the next decade. Where do you insist on having humans in the loop? 
and his concern about adversaries not maintaining their standard is a reality that's already unfolding. Here's the trap Western militaries are walking into. There's widespread recognition that ethics has a role to play in the autonomous weapons debate but deep uncertainty about what that role is. While democracies hold conferences and draft principles, the technology keeps advancing and adversaries keep deploying. The policy question gets even harder when you understand what human in the loop actually means in practice. There is a distinction between human in the loop where humans must take positive action to lethal force, human on the loop where humans supervise and can veto, and human out of the loop where machines operate autonomously after activation. That's three fundamentally different levels of control, and the line between them gets blurry fast on an actual battlefield. Imagine you're a drone operator and your swarm of drones is approaching a target. Russian jamming cuts your signal. Do the drones abort and return? Do they complete the pre-planned mission? Do they use the AI to find alternative targets? Lewis mentions Palantir software captures everything the decision maker knew at the time. And this is significant from a legal and ethical standpoint. The dehumanization of warfare and the violation of human dignity are critical concerns when autonomous weapon systems reduce targets to mere data points. But if you can order exactly what information was available, what the AI recommended and why the human made their decision, you've created accountability even in autonomous systems. But of course, it's not all as simple as this. Russian forces have spent considerable effort to locate and neutralize Ukrainian drone pilots, and in October 2024, captured and executed nine Ukrainian drone operators. When the drone pilots are being hunted and killed, the operational incentive to remove humans from four positions becomes overwhelming. This creates a terrible dynamic. If Russia or China deploy fully autonomous systems that can operate faster and more aggressively than Western systems, with human oversight, do Western militaries maintain their principles and accept tactical disadvantages? Or do they quietly expand what human in the loop means until it becomes meaningless? Ads are expensive and people don't trust them anymore, but they do trust YouTube. That's why three of our clients now make $100,000 a month for their business from growing a YouTube channel. If you run a business, book a call with me and I'll help you map this out.